Okay, so welcome everyone to the second Gatan Analytical Webinar of 2021. So for anyone who hasn't attended any of our other analytical webinars, I'm Liam Spillane. I'm the Analytical Application Scientist for Catan based out of Pleasanton, California. I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Peng Zhang. Peng has been very active in advanced material characterization in the San Francisco Bay Area since 2005, where he started at Intel after completing his PhD in nanoscale science and engineering at UC Berkeley. Since his time at Intel, Peng has continued his work in advanced microscopy, taking positions at Western Digital, Nanolab Technologies, and most recently EAG Laboratories. He's also spent a lot of time building academic collaborations with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, ASU, UIUIC, and BNL. At EAG, Peng has very recently been promoted from Senior Director of the Advanced Imaging Group to Vice President of Business Development, and today he's going to be talking about the microscopy projects that he leads at EAG. So just before uh, we get going, just some housekeeping. So if anyone has any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to submit using the webinar questions pane for GoToWebinar. We'll deal with any questions regarding connectivity and webinar viewing immediately, and any questions relating to the presentation content uh, will be answered at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'll hand over to Peng. So go ahead. Thank you, Liam, for the uh, nice introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening for all the audience. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the EOS uh, for, for semiconductor device characterization. Um, so uh, first, uh, as, um, as Liam just uh, um, mentioned, I have been in the Bay Area for a very long time. Uh, so our, our lab is somewhere here. So just for reference, uh, some, this is San Francisco, uh, airport is, is, is a very nice picture of the Bay Area. Of course, we, we serve a lot of the companies in, in the Bay Area. Um, um, you know, we work on semiconductor uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a major part of our business, but you know, we also do analyze uh, a whole lot of other materials. Uh, I found that the EOS uh, technique is very, very useful uh, for, for material analysis. Um, okay, first of all, uh, when we, when we, whenever we talk about semiconductor, we cannot really just bypass the Moore's law. Um, for a very, very large part, the uh, microscopy analysis is, is really also driven by, by the Moore's law. As you can see in, in this next slide, the device is really shrinking uh, to nowadays is sub 10 nanometer technology, right? Um, at the, at the age of about 2000, 2000 actually, uh, the um, so the silicon industry is really uh, um, a nanotechnology industry. Right? Um, if you go back to the history, you you, you will find uh, at about uh, 2005, 2006, the uh, aberration corrected stem enters uh, entered the industrial labs for the uh, uh, characterization of uh, of uh, silicon devices. Um, you know, it's necessary for for uh, really uh, the technology development for for these nanotechnologies. Uh, of course, um, if you if you go um, uh, beyond this sub ten nanometer um, uh, technologies, uh, a lot of the interesting problems uh, are actually at the interfaces. Right? For example, you have the uh, the, the so called the, uh, the the metal gate. You also have the uh, high K or high kappa. Uh, dielectric material. Right? So there's a lot of interesting materials um, properties. Um, so another front, of course, is uh, is a three D land. Uh, so I think everybody has maybe hundreds of, hundred of gigabytes of three uh, D land these days in your cell phone or in your laptop uh, with with a solid state drive. Right. Uh, basically, uh, in in the past, the um, uh, memory, uh, the solid state memory, is basically a one floor, a single house, or you know, apartment. Now uh, the 3D land is a 3D uh, a skyscraper scraper, uh, uh, of memory. So you basically stacking uh, uh, nowadays hundreds of layers of memory unit 
from from silicon all the way up. So it's, it's really really complicated uh, engineering. Uh, of course, uh, if you're old school, um, you, you still use probably the hard disk drive. Um, the uh, hard disk drive, of course, is, is really magnificent because in the 1950s, the, 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 if it, yeah, the first hard, hard disk drive is basically a uh, really hard disk, right? If you, if you come to the San Francisco Bay Area, visit a technology museum, you can still see the gigantic uh, hard disk uh, in, in, in the museum. Uh, of course, right now, uh, the um, you know the, uh, the hard disk drive is so small and with so high error density. Uh, this is if you if you really do the calculation uh, for the for the very early uh, generation of uh, of uh, HDD, you will find that the error density is really really so low. Um, uh, you know uh, this is so low, and if you still remember your graduate school, uh, the so-called cheat sheet. Um, this error density is, is, is just about that. You can basically handwrite your, 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 your signal on hard disk drive. So uh, a, a lot of the um, um, elements are also involved, right? So this is just a partial list of, of elements you will find in your HDD. I, I didn't even mention, for example, gallium arsenide, Indian gallium arsenide, this type of uh, you know, uh, LED or laser uh, um, type of material. Um, so, uh, for for technological development, you really need high resolution, and high sensitivity, for 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 the um, uh, for the for the analysis, right? Uh, for this talk, I only you know focus on very very narrow, very, but also very powerful technique TM use. Uh, but in reality, a lot of the real world engineering problems, they they really need a very broad uh, spectrum of uh, of of techniques for. Uh, for either chemistry or composition or dopant analysis. Uh, and uh, for, for, for this talk, we'll also only cover silicon devices, uh, but EOS techniques can also be readily applied to many other uh, compound semiconductors like gallium nitride, silicon carbide, gallium arsenide, uh, so on and so on. Right? Um, so as I, as I mentioned, uh, you know, TEM and, and EDS or EOS is only very, very small corner of of the um, of, of of this uh, of this chart. If you want uh, you know dopant analysis, of course you can you can do same. So, you know, sometimes people want to um, um, you know have the uh, absolute composition analysis that this RBS. Uh, so that there's a whole lot of uh, analytical capabilities that you can choose uh, to to solve your a specific problem. All right. So of course, first of all, it is about sample prep. Uh, whenever you uh, start with the uh, nano electronic device, you always want to start with a focus ion beam um, um, sample preparation. Uh, so basically, it's just digging, digging, and thinking, right? So it's it's it's, it's pretty thin, pretty simple. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, and uh, a a very good um, uh, application of FIB SEM, of course, you can do the slice and 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 the view, and you can also uh, reconstruct the tomogram, so which is not really the focus of this, uh, of, of this talk. So one, this slide is really, really uh, um, uh, worth mentioning. Uh, whenever we are dealing with, uh, you know, for example, sub 10 nanometer device, uh, your TEM sample is often thicker than your three dimensional feature, right? And uh, everybody knows TEM imaging uh, for most of the time is a 2D projection of a 3D uh, uh, object, right? So you, you really need to worry about uh, uh, this projection effect when, whenever you are dealing with a real engineering problem for, for nanoelectronic devices, right? So for some of the uh, planar device is, is less a problem. So, you know, this, this is always a concern. Uh, TEM, uh, again, EOS is, is, a, is for most of the time is, is a STEM-based technique. Um, you know, you can, you can, nowadays you can uh, collect uh, simultaneously EDS and EOS analysis, a uh, EOS data set, and then you, uh, the rest is basically about uh, data analysis, right, of the, of, of the three-dimensional data, data qubit. Uh, I think most of our, most of this audience knows uh, EOS is also um, uh, very sensitive to the, to the chemical bonding uh, of, of, of the elements. Um, of course, this is a historical view uh, of the resolution. I don't want to spend too much here. 
nowadays, uh, you know, Professor Muller back in uh, how many years ago? It's already 13 years ago, published this nice paper is about atomic resolution um, uh, yields analysis of the uh, of these interfaces, right? Um, what, what I always mention is that uh, this kind of resolution can be readily achievable on commercial uh, TEM these days, but this does not mean your sample will have such high resolution. Right? Uh, you always always need to worry about the electron beam damage, especially for for some of the uh, semiconductors. It is really near impossible to get such high. Uh, resolution, uh, for example, on, on silicon silicon dioxide interface is going to be, um, you know, the sample will be basically cooked. All right. So what we can do with this uh, with this fancy tool, right? Um, so I will show you some example. Uh, this is a uh, uh, first example is a three D land. Um, if you uh, if you basically sample the the device from the top down, which is plan view, and from cross section. Um, so now they are actually at the, at the same magnification. You you will see that they have very complicated three-dimensional structure. Uh, and of course, uh, if you uh, do the uh, do the uh, in and out uh, of, of of the plan view, this is the cross section, right? If you do uh, in and out for cross section, would be plan view. You, you got. I, think, I hope you got my idea. Um, so a, a lot of the um, uh, 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 interesting. Uh, problem is really uh, how to how to engineer uh, this this complicated uh, uh, material stack. For example, in this case, uh, uh, you, you know your your information is stored, I believe, uh, on the silicon nitride layer is is char charge trapping, and then you got the silicon channels. Right? And so then, uh, for process engineer perspective, you really want to understand how these elements uh, are distributed uh, relative to each other. So in 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 this slide, um, you know, we we basically map out uh, all important elements from uh, from boron to to tungsten. Uh, to be honest, this is actually the first time I I I detect the boron uh, in in my at least in my career for 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 for, for the silicon device. Um, you know, of course, silicon uh, in, in silicon device boron was used for doping. Uh, but you know, but in this case, yeah, I think so, the engineers use the maybe boron uh, uh, tungsten boride, uh, you know, to to de deposit the this um, uh, these tungsten materials. Uh, and uh, I think for this audience, I don't need to emphasize too much. Uh, but before um, people all use uh, uh, people all, all thought, you know. Um, EOS, okay, EOS is good for light elements like boron and carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, right? But nowadays, uh, of course, the EOS technique or EOS spectrometer um, uh, was improved so much. You can basically uh, detect, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of the, uh, even heavy elements like tungsten, gold, platinum uh, with, with EOS these days, right? For example, with the uh, uh, the new continuum. Uh, during in in the dual use mode, you can comfortably cover about five to six thousand EV <clears throat> of of range. You can do a lot of stuff uh, with this wide range of of of, of energy window. And okay, a, a very big uh, part of our business actually uh, for for the um, for the TEM analyst is to present the data to um, a long expert. Right, if you are a process engineer. You probably just want to know the relevant, uh, the relative uh, elemental distribution. So we basically can, you know, can color uh, these maps and overlay to each other, and then you can see, uh, spatially, the very nice, uh, uh, you know, spatial distribution of, for example, this is a silicon channel, and then there's a uh, there's a tiny uh, layer of uh, of a silicon nitride, and then there's oxide nitride oxide, very complicated. Uh, uh, a layer, and I believe this silicon nitride layer is is is, is used for for information storage. Right? So basically, your uh, electrons are, are are stored here um, uh, in, in this tiny layer. Uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, another uh, very interesting thing you can do is to do the bonding. Right? Uh, in in this case, um, my my initial purpose is, was to do just do the elemental distribution. I didn't pay much attention actually. Try to optimize the low loss, uh, so you can see the the uh, um, the uh, uh, the um, L edge of, of the silicon 
uh, uh, EOS Edge is relatively, you know, uh, noisy, but you know, you can see actually the the um, it changes with with bonded, right? And uh, um, of course, what you can do is to to switch to a higher dispersion uh, to basically com double confirm uh the, the 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 bonding of you know of 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 each individual of each individual um layer uh of course for for silicon silicon oxide uh, oxide and silicon nitride uh you can see um you know in the the very nice thing about the eos community is that uh this type of uh, reference uh, spectra uh, are uh you know are widely uh, uh you know accessible and uh, you know, you can you can download it from the <coughs> open website and then you know if you analyze the silicon oxide in my lab or in your own lab, um, as long as it's calibrated, calibrated, it will probably get pretty much the same uh, <clears throat> type of spectra, right? And then once you get this uh, uh, reference spectrum, uh, then you can you can do the uh, multiple linear disk feeding, right? Uh, again, this data is is basically from the um, simultaneous uh, high high low loss uh, EOS mapping, right? You can use um, um, high loss, for example, the um, uh, silicon K edge at uh, 1800 EV to do the elemental mapping, and then if you want to confirm uh, um, the, the 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 bonding, uh, most of the time the L edge will have better signal signal to noise ratio, uh, right? Uh, for for this kind of analysis, I want to mention that the K edge is also sensitive to to, to the bonding. It's just that uh, you, if you want to have enough counts. Um, you you still need to have a, a very long acquisition time, right? Uh, and of course, if you have a longer acquisition time, you're going to cook a sample, right? So so you need to choose properly uh, the uh, the edge for analysis. Uh, another uh, uh, another thing, uh, this is a little bit more quantitative uh, or semi-quantitative, I should say, is that once you have um, have have the uh, uh, once you have the the composition of each individual um, uh, silicon phase, then you can you can basically do uh, uh, you know get the um, combination of silicon nitride and <coughs> silicon oxide uh, in a ratio. For example, in this case, that th this is actually a, a layer of a silicon oxide nitride. Right? So this uh, um, uh, I, I'm I'm not very sure if it, if if this is intentional or not intentional. Uh, by the process engineer, because uh, sometimes uh, you know the uh, uh, pro uh, it actually it actually engineer they they sometimes they want to dope, for example, nitrogen in the silicon oxide to improve the dielectric uh, property of, of, of the tunneling layer. Right. So okay, so uh, uh, most of, most of the time uh, the process engineer also want to study the interface uh, 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 from cross section. Right uh, again. Uh, with the with the um, uh, with the newer generation of spectrometer, you can, you can basically get the um, uh, uh, you know in in this case we we switch to um, uh, a little bit higher dispersion, and then you can see the you know silicon K edge and the silicon L edge they they both have very good um, uh, um, counts right. Uh, again, uh, you can repeat the whatever analysis for the plan view. Uh, typically, I want to use the silicon K edge for element mapping because the, uh, the at the low energy uh, there could be a complicated uh, ba background. All right, for uh, for uh, for 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 example, for error density calculation. Um, so uh, this will be quick, and uh, again, we we basically confirm uh, the that there's really a boron. Uh, in in this tiny uh, layer here, uh, I'm I am not very familiar uh, with the processing, uh, but I think this is uh, uh, is intentionally uh, designed to use uh, use this boride um, to grow the, uh, to grow these uh, metal layers. Um, uh, again, uh, so uh, EOS analysis can be uh, you know uh, used to analyze. Uh, light elements, uh, as light as boring in this case, and heavy elements uh, like tungsten. Okay, uh, not not only 3D land is is going to 3D. Uh, if you're if you're talking about the uh, CPU uh, of your uh, or, or GPU of your of your computer of your cell phone, um, you know. Uh, so this is basically a logic uh, device, right? So if you if you if you zoom in. 
uh, the, uh, the, the gate uh, of, of your transistor, uh, you can see actually, uh, so at, at the bottom is, is basically the, the um, uh, silicon substrate, and then you get a very, very complicated high K uh, or high kappa, high, di high uh, dielectric constant, um, you know, material, and then the, the metal gate, right? So, um, uh, so th there are uh, there are a lot of interesting elements uh, in, involved in, into the fabrication. Uh, so actually, carbon is, is also uh, is somewhere here uh, as the, as the so-called low K material, right? So in the silicon transistor, you basically use the high K for the tunneling gate, and you also uh, for the use the low K or low kappa. To reduce the really the um, uh, the capacitance uh, coupling right between your 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 metal contact and, and uh, basically between your devices. So there's a, there's a layer of carbon here I, I didn't show you. Otherwise the map will be very very busy. So again uh, uh, to the left side is is EOS analysis. To the right side of, uh, is is EDS. Um, okay, I just want to emphasize is that you know the EDS uh, um, appears to be a little bit noisier. Um, uh, I I don't really want to say that e e EDS will completely replace EOS, right? So that's that's not uh, uh, that that's not the um, you know uh, right conclusion in my opinion, uh, because uh, EDS, for example, sometimes for the um, um, uh, lower low concentration of uh, of, uh, uh, of of confirmation, if you want, um, you know, the, because of the very uh, nice Gaussian type of uh, peaks. Uh, makes the tiny signal uh, easier to to be detected by either human eyes or software, right? So um, I, I always mention to my my client is that you you always want to do probably simultaneous EDS and, and EOS, um, you know, for for a full uh, understanding of the of the structure. Um, and then once we once we have the uh, aero density map in in in, in previous uh, slide, this is the aero density. Uh, map and then you can basically uh, uh, use a line cut or a line profile to to draw a line across this gate and then you can map out the, uh, you, can, you can basically give the relative composition of of uh, of individual uh, individual layer. All right, I don't want to spend too much time here, but again, you can um, analyze uh, light elements as light as nitrogen, carbon, and heavy elements like tantalum, hafnium, and, and and tungsten. So of course, the, you know, uh, compare with EDS, EOS has uh, higher energy resolution. Um, for example, if you use EDS, you probably have a pretty high background of nitrogen or oxygen, and also the silicon, hafnium, and tantalum, they all have uh, uh, overlapping edges or overlapping <laughs> peaks, I should say. Um, so you 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 want to. Um, uh, uh, may, you know, uh, use EOS in this case to to separate the signal um, uh, to, for better an analysis of, of, of the interface uh, layers. And again, uh, EOS carries the bonding uh, information. In this case, uh, very interestingly, you have a different flavor of uh, flavors of titanium, uh, titanium nitride, aluminum tie, and this is probably a uh, accidental. Uh, uh, oxidation of your al aluminum tie alloy uh, at the at the top of uh, uh, of your metal gate. Right? So you can you can basically uh, double confirm uh, with, with your with with the EOS uh, um, uh, spectra, right? Um, so the pr previous example is, was still a uh, two is a, was still a, a planar uh, silicon device. Uh, in our lab, we also can do. Um, you know, 32, uh, 22 nanometer is the first generation of FinFET, and now it is very complicated three-dimensional, uh, um, uh, uh, three-dimensional structure, right? So the, the this width is is only about you know, uh, 10 nanometer these days, or se below seven nanometer these days, right? So again, uh, whenever you are dealing with uh, such tiny three-dimensional device, you always worry about uh, your your sample preparation artifact, right? So what is next, <clears throat> right? Um, so everybody wants um, more and more gigabyte and the faster and faster uh, 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 processor. Uh, and uh, this is uh, actually pretty much like a fresh news. IBM just uh, uh, announced a, a two nanometer uh, technology 
for you know for for the for the future um, logic uh, device, right? So they have very very complicated structure. They have the nano sheet. They also have the um, you know heavy um, you know tungsten. Um, in, in my in my opinion, I think this is a tungsten metal gate. Uh, so it, it's a lot of uh, um, in, uh, uh, engineering challenges because you're uh, integrating a lot of different elements into really really small scale. Um, for for this type of analysis, I think the FIP uh, artifact is is not uh, or sample preparation artifact is is in is not a is is not a you know avoidable. Uh, you probably need to think about uh, uh, 3D EOS tomography, right? So if you if you look look into the literature, there are uh, a lot of publication from from the academia really about um, um, uh, very robust uh, materials or ceramics most of the time. Um, but for for semiconductor device, you really need to uh, think about um, you know uh, uh, controlling the dosage, right? And so from that perspective, uh, I think a, a grand challenge for Gatan is to uh, probably detect 100% um, of of the electrons and with extremely fast uh, uh, readout. And then of course uh, we also need to worry about the workflow, um, you know, for for industry. Uh, we cannot afford, uh, you know, deliver data with with one month of so-called turnaround time, right? So that's uh, something you you don't want to do. Um, again, uh, for 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 the silicon um, uh, industry or for the for the materials development in general, there are so many different techniques you can choose. Um, sometimes we we were asked to. Um, you know, pro to provide the open type of information. I always want to emphasize uh, EOS at this point is not a open technique yet, right? Uh, for in, in our laboratory, we, we, can, all, we can we actually often uh, combine atom probe uh, um, uh, technology with TEM and EOS, uh, EOS EDS uh, uh, analysis um, combined together. To give a full view of your of or more complete view of your of your sample, right? You can use your TEM and EOS or EDS to combine uh, to give your composition information of the major uh, constitute uh, composition uh, major elements, and then uh, uh, use the uh, we use the atom probe for the for the dopant uh, mapping. Uh, of course, uh, semiconductor is is much more than silicon. Uh, if you think about, um, you know, the we are now everybody talks about 5G. Uh, everybody talks about a electrical vehicle. Uh, so that we consume a lot of uh, compound uh, semiconductor uh, these days, right? So in this case, is a as a aluminum nitride uh, growing on silicon carbide, right? So again, for 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 a lot of the uh, um, uh, materials problems, right? So uh, the, uh, the the uh, what what matters is actually the interface control. Right? If you if you cannot control the interface, you probably cannot control uh, your device performance. Right? In, in, from that perspective, then uh, EOS technique will be very very powerful. Right? Um, you know, for for the study of uh, of, of uh, both chemistry and the bonding uh, uh, at the interface. So. Um, uh, this is uh, the summary of my presentation. Uh, I want to leave a little bit more time for uh, for for question uh, uh, for question if you have. Um, this is a summary. Uh, nowadays, TEM is much more than a fancy camera. I think everybody knows this. is a very powerful uh, nano characterization platform. Right. As, as of right now, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy is pretty much the only type of uh, um, uh, microscopy technique for the study of ke both chemistry and the bonding at the interfaces of, of, uh, of a semiconductor nano devices, right? Uh, of course, the recent development of, uh, of the fast EOS spectrometer helped to reduce acquisition time uh, with reduced e electron dosage. Uh, and for, for, you know, for deep sub 10 nanometer Technology development. Um, we probably want to think about really a, a effective EOS tomography workflow, right? So the uh, as as I just mentioned, uh, tom EOS tomography has been published for 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 a while. But we we really need to think about how to uh, collect the data quickly, how to process the data quickly, and how to 
uh, how to uh, basically present uh, the uh, very complicated uh, four-dimensional data set to a uh, long expert, like a process engineer. Right? So this, this is probably more uh, relevant to, to, the, to the industry, right? Uh, I think one final comment about the uh, about the uh, uh, about the EOS uh, technique these days is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, with the with the dual EOS mode, you can open up the uh, five thousand EV of range, right? But if you if you go to the uh, quantification mode, you will find uh, many of the uh, um, many of the high energy uh, uh, signal don't have a reliable. Uh, 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 cross-section, you know, model, right? So, if you want to, uh, for example, quantify <clears throat> with, with a higher energy, uh, we, you you don't need you don't have the 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 um, the, the, the cross-section model yet for for the quantification. So, I think this is probably uh, some homework for our Gatan colleague to figure out, uh, you know, uh, to maybe patch the software. Right. With that, uh, so this is the end of my. Uh, 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 end of my talk, and uh, thank you, thank you for the, for your attention. Uh, I think we are now open for questions. Great, thanks very much, Peng. It was really exciting to see uh, the cool work that you're doing in the lab. So yeah, we've had a, a few questions come in. Some of them are, are quite um, straightforward, so perhaps we can start with those. So one question that was asked was which TM do you use in the lab? Uh, I think it was sp specifically for the FinFET uh, data or the and the 3D NAND data. So, what instrument were you using? Which microscope? Well, what I can say is this is a Gatan U spectrometer, right? And uh, uh, you know, um, for for our lab, we 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 use the uh, Thermo Fisher uh, TEM. Uh, but I think uh, as long as you have a good environment and a proper setup, proper alignment, uh, you know, either Hitachi or uh, or Thermo Fisher or JUL can probably do a similar type of a job. Yeah. And then is it a corrected, is it like corrected, it's probe corrected oh, yes, or something? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. And actually one question that I had was what, do you know what probe current you, you used for the particularly for the 3D NAND, the, the mapping, do you have an idea? Well, you need to be very, very careful, right? So mm -hmm. uh, if I have a choice, I want to, I, I want to pump two nano ampere of current. Uh, with a probe correction, you can still pump two, you know, one nano ampere for sure with Armstrong resolution, right? Uh, but you, you really want to, um, you know, control the dosage a little bit or, or control the dosage rate uh, a little bit, right? So in, in this particular case, I believe I use uh, probe current about 600 nano ampere. Right? Okay. I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a little bit focused here. But, you know, uh, for individual problems, you, you really want to use a dummy region to, to establish your probe current. Mm. Yeah, that's true, yeah. So that actually kind of leads quite nicely into another question that I was thinking. So kind of actually relates to the, I was really interested, actually I wanted to ask about the, the two nanometer technology, but you, you had the slides there already. So it's interesting to see that you think tomography is, is really kind of critical for, um, for the two nanometer technology. Have you any thought on, Kind of the sample geometry that you would have like from the fib would you use a uh, kind of a regular fib section or would you have something that was more like the atom probe kind of samples yeah <clears throat> if i have a choice i always uh, for tomography if i have any choice i want to do a, uh, a needle type of atom probe type of uh, uh, geometry right so that will make your data interpretation uh, much easier right? mm -hmm. um, but you know for for engineering problems, you especially if you are working in the semiconductor industry, uh, you you don't have time to be honest to have a, for example, uh, you, you you don't have time to collect a, a very very large data set, have the best spatial resolution. That's not the purpose, right? Um, you know you can probably still use the two dimensional planar type of sample, right? Of course, then. Uh, if you tilt it to, with with large tilt angle to sixty degrees, your sample thickness doubled, uh, mm -hmm. which probably can complicate things a little bit. But if your sample 
well, in this case, your sample is still pretty thin, right? Uh, think about maybe, for example, 30 nanometer of, uh, of sample thickness or 20 nanometer, even if double is only 40 nanometer, right? Still below the 0 pi, 0 0.5 or half lambda, right? So the lambda is the mean free pass of ele ele electrons, right? So if you have, uh, um, you know, thinner samples, uh, I think to the 2D, a uh, planar sample is probably not a big deal, uh, but I I just don't have the data to support my uh, argument here. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. I guess I was thinking as well, you'd need to be uh, probably consider the probe current much more carefully when you're doing uh, tomography rather than just a standard Samuels experiment, because presumably oh, we'd be in limit. We're radiating the area way way more. Because you yeah. have to do a series. Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, for for semiconductor devices, uh, as I as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of this presentation, right? Uh, I I have never been able to do atomic resolution EOS for silicon device, right? Mm. Uh, because silicon device uh, at the neighborhood you you got uh, you got a dielectric material, right? You got the, both high K and the low K materials surrounding the, uh, the the silicon right you uh you you can probably get close to maybe five or six inch from uh of, of use resolution but if you want to go really uh to atomic resolution uh it, it, it is is a great challenge i uh i i hope the you know the, some of the audience uh from the from the academia can help to answer this type of question what is really the fundamental limit uh, of the of the eos technique for for you know this type of nano and near samples, right? Um, you can you can do this on ceramic, but it's not relevant to the ceramic semiconductor industry most of the time. Mm. Okay, cool. And I had a, some question about atom probe tomography. Have you done much correlative work where you would do kind of um, kind of what's the kind of the practicality of? Because I presume that you would have your fib section your atom probe sample you would do your uh, tm analysis and then you put it in the atom probe uh, how difficult or easy is that process is that something that you can do routinely or is it a bit kind of more of a niche technique yeah so i think i think um, uh, this is actually a great question right um so um unfortunately atom probe uh, is still not a um, you know, universally, uh, you know, applicable technique for many materials, right? Um, or I should say many engineering materials. Uh, there are some publication about, for example, atom probe on, on the, uh, uh, on the silicon nano devices. Again, as long as you integrate, uh, highly insulated material, highly conductive metals and semiconductor material together at the nano scale, there's a lot of complication, right? Uh, so you you do need to so basically it's a case by case type of uh, analysis right for for the for the metals uh, some ceramics and the uh, and and the um, uh, in this case the the um, uh, LED type of semiconductor is pretty straightforward right um, mm. pretty much every every atom probe uh, tomography sample is automatically a TM sample right you can we we can always uh, insert the uh, uh, atom probe sample into our TEM to get the uh, um, dimension, right? And, and then you can basically correlate the TEM image with, with this uh, atom probe uh, uh, tomogram data, right? Mm. So you, always, you always want to do that. But unfortunately, not all the elements are, are, are possible, right? So yeah. um, again, uh, all, all the techniques uh, have their own limitations, right? Including EOS. Right? Um, so you, that's why you, you really want to, for example, if you go to an analytical lab, you always want to, you want to basically, if you are a process engineer, you always want to have a provenance statement. You, you just don't want to say, oh, I want to go to EOS, right? Uh, sometimes EOS is probably not the best for your, uh, for your problem. You want to always select the right technique to solve your problem. Excellent. One kind of question that I, I was curious about here, is it how, practical is it if you if you had one of these samples in the tm just based on the geometry and the size how practical is it to do something like tilt to 
a zone axis for something that's that is it super small sample or is it it with a modern stage is that actually something that's achievable yeah that this is actually a very good question uh so the the needles of course can be uh in this case is about 80 nanometer uh in in this case so it's it's fairly good size right and okay. something yeah something you can control is that when you, when you load a sample something you can control is you always want to um, be careful during the sample preparation, right? You always mount your uh, needle on a flat type of a sample holder or sample grid. Uh, before you cut, you can either come, in this case, you can cut the A plane or M plane, right? Uh, so that makes your tilt not really very difficult, right? Of course, it's a very small area, but you already have a very good starting point, right? As long as you do the bulk uh, type of sample preparation carefully at the beginning. Cool. Okay, thanks. And then actually a question that came in right at the beginning that I forgot to ask yet uh, was a question about the sample. Again, it's a, a sample prep related question, so the link's quite good. So can we use the FIB to prepare insulating samples and is there anything that we need to uh, be especially careful when preparing cross-section cross -section, uh, cross-section samples with the FIB? Yeah, I think generally you need to be very careful, right? So um, uh, that, that, you know, that a, lot, a lot of the engineering samples, you know, you really need to worry about damages, right? So either from electrons or from the ion beam or from the air, right? If you expose, for example, lithium iron battery to air, your sample is basically dead, right? You, you, you cannot use it anymore. So there's such a limit, right? So you can, you know, in our uh, yeah, lab, we, we, we prepare samples from ceramics all the time. Uh, some of the uh, engineering problems really use uh, sapphire, uh, you, you know, or even silicon carbide is highly insulating, right? So you, you can, uh, uh, you know, prepare the sample with, with FIB these days. Um, you know, uh, that's, that's not a big, typically it's not a big problem. But of course, there's a certain limit, right? If you uh, cut organic samples, insulating samples, you always want it to be very careful. And again, this is very specific. If, if you have a, um, you know, specific, specific problems, you can probably reach us. Indeed. Okay. So, yeah. Let's see what else. Maybe we can do a couple more. Um, let's see what we have here. So um, there was a question that was about the monochromation. They're kind of a little little haphazard now. We do a couple, so I could probably answer that one. Is an eels monochromator helpful for characterizing bonding or not relevant? It kind of depends on the ionization edge you're looking at. So a very very high uh, energy loss. It's less relevant because the uh, the features are just broadened out. So it really is kind of signal dependent. So yes and no depending on the signal good then what else do we have uh maybe yeah one. so uh, i just have one comment in, in our lab we do have the monochromation right uh, i just didn't turn it on because uh, okay. it will reduce the uh, probe current like crazy so yeah it's good to have but not always necessary yeah that's yeah for sure i'd, I'd agree it definitely, I think whenever you're kind of talking about energy resolution, you actually have to think about the fundamental features in the ionization edges that you're looking at and then think what yeah. it's like, what resolution do you need for the experiment and not to yeah. just assume that you always need something super high because when you monochromate, you make compromise, you're going to throw away yeah. a signal and the setup time is a little bit higher. Yeah. So there's, there's, there's a trade-off. The, the kind of one thing that is kind of nice with the monochromator is that you can kind of tune, you can go in between. So if you go for the ultra highest energy resolution, you throw away a lot of current, but you can go some sort of intermediate step. And then you kind of have a nice compromise between a decent amount of probe current and still a moderate energy resolution, which is... Yeah, so for example, in this case, uh, the dispersion is, I believe, is 0.75 EV per channel. Of course, okay. then uh, you don't you don't see much need of uh, a monochromation, right? 
Uh, yeah. On the upside, if you're dealing with, for example, band gap mapping of, of, of the, uh, of the uh, semiconductor ataxial layers, of course, you want a more correlation. Right? So again, yes, it's really uh, nice to have, but it's not always necessary. It really depends on your problem. Okay. And I think we've got one, maybe one more question. Um, do you have any tips for extracting boron um, by an MLLS fitting as it I believe it's heavily overlapping the silicon? No, not, not really actually. Um, you know, is it yes or no, right? If you have a trace amount of, uh, of boron, uh, also spatially overlapping with 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 silicon, you're in, you're in big trouble, right? <laughs> I do agree. Uh, yeah. But in, yeah. But in, in this particular case, the boron is somewhere here. So mm. uh, you, I, I did actually go into the um, uh, into the into the raw data, and and the, the nice thing about the boron is that uh, uh, there's some good reference spectra in in the, in uh, in a public domain. Uh, really about the boron and the boron oxide uh, uh, type of bonding, right? So mm. uh, the, the the nice thing about the yields is that uh, you you see an edge there, and you can just go there and conf you know just double check the the so called shape of the yield spectra, and then give you more confidence, right? And then uh, uh, that you know uh, in in this case uh, we this all this map here for boron is basically by direct error density calculation. There's no uh, mm. Multiple linear least square fitting here. Okay. Because the signal, the, the signal is so strong. Yeah. 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 Makes sense. But then, yeah, I've just been thinking about that while you've been talking. And actually, to separate them um, by fitting, I would just say you just need to have kind of good quality references for the two signals. So you could, you could, you don't necessarily need to get them from the data set internally. You could have an ex an externally acquired boron reference, an externally acquired silicon reference, and then you've basically got very good reference spectra for your fitting for the two signals. And then we'd ex probably expect it to, to be a linear combination of the two references. So we should be able to um, separate them like that. Yeah. Or, use the, or do the quantification instead of with the, just kind of the standard cross sections you could use um, with the standards kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think, Liam, you, you mentioned a very good point about, about using standard, right? I think um, uh, if you go to the digital micrograph newer version three, you do have the option of using standard quantification, right? Um, you know, the, the, the beautiful thing about, about the EOS community is pretty open. I think Katem, Made, made made the platform pretty open. You can write a script. Everybody can share a lot of stuff uh, in, in in the public domain. Uh, if you if you're really talking about the chemistry uh, of 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 of, the, of of this different en uh, engineer, well, relevant to engineering problems, I think we still have a, a as a EOS community, we still have a lot of things to do, right? Um, for example, if you want to say find a um, uh, some kind of a reference. Um, uh, in, I, I, I'm just giving a random example. Okay, so if you if you want to uh, give a titanium oxide nitride, for example, right? Uh, is is it, it, I'm just keep, just making up. Um, you probably cannot find a good reference in 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 the, in, in the in the literature. But you know, I think for um, maybe some of the, um, our audience can probably develop a project just to build. Uh, a good database of, uh, of of important engineering materials mm. for for quantification really yeah it would be nice to kind of have some expanded standards list because we definitely have a lot of other in the community there's a lot of kind of common references but it would be good to have you know a much expanded uh, with like kind of single scattering distribution references for the uh, particularly for kind of different angular conditions, different beam energies, and et cetera, et cetera. And it would be nice to just have that kind of fast, much faster available. That would be great, I think. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But maybe that's something we can uh, get going. Yeah. Cool.
Okay, uh, I think there's there's kind of a lot more questions, but I think we're about uh, kind of at time. So any of the questions that we haven't already covered, we will follow up and we can answer by email. So either I can answer or Peng will answer for you. And I just want to thank Peng again. Thanks for the great talk and thanks for agreeing to give the talk. And thanks everyone for attending the webinar. So great. So I'll leave it there. Cheers.